So, um, there's a couple of small countries around the world. Sweden is one of them. Um, Israel is another small country, even smaller than Sweden. But the country has produced an amazing number of startups that have become international companies. Just like us, they face the same challenge of not having a large domestic market. They have even small domestic market than we have. I have been inspired a lot by that uh, when I started Sting 10 years ago. One very important actor in Israel that helps startups become international growth companies, Jerusalem Venture Partners. They have over 900 million US dollars under management today, started as an incubator in Jerusalem. And this company, GVP, they have led more than 20 companies to exit and many IPOs on the Nasdaq exchange. They have developed more than 85 successful startup companies. One of their most recent successful cases is the Swedish startup company ClickTech, and we have members from the ClickTech founders here today also. That was listed on NASDAQ 2010 and was regarded as one of the most successful listings that year. Market cap 2.5 billion US dollar, 2010. Mr. Erel Margalit is founder and chairman of Jerusalem Venture Partners, and he is also a ClickTech board member. He will now share his vast experience of how to scale and build technology co companies from a small nation to really international companies. Welcome, Erel. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this lovely introduction. So we will talk a little bit about JVP, but then we'll have an honest discussion on how to build real international companies, and I hope we can open up for questions. So JVP uh, is one of the largest funds in Israel. Uh, we started over 90 companies, most of them from, scra from scratch. And we are located in the media quarter that is called after JVP in uh, the, uh, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. And, um, and what we have there is an incubator with about 250 uh, young people that are starting the most interesting companies in Israel today. And we also have a big social project for the poor kids in Jerusalem, both Jewish and Arab, and we're, we transform the lives of many people in the community as well. And we also have a performing arts center, which the younger people in the city put together, and it's one of the vibrant places and a few great restaurants. And so everybody likes to talk about their best companies. We have been fortunate enough to have 23. Uh, tonight I heard it's uh, 24 exits. Um, 11 IPOs on NASDAQ uh, with some of the largest companies that came out of Israel, um, but also uh, um, 12 industry sales with some of the largest exits. And of course, we're very proud uh, uh, last year uh, with ClickTech, which is uh, one of the uh, best IPOs to come outside of the United States in the last uh, 10 years. And so some of these large exits includes companies like Chromatis, which we started from scratch with the entrepreneurs after the first company that we backed with them was sold for 76 million. This company was sold for 4.8 billion. Uh, companies like um, Netro, which um, was the first wireless last mile company, which uh, we started from scratch with $666,000, and it reached a $5.5 billion market cap and uh, we were very fortunate to be involved in this. Of course, Click, which is a great story on its own, where uh, you have here uh, the former CEO and chairman of the company, uh, Mans, and uh, he will speak to you a little later. And uh, this is a, a, an experience that was great, amazing, because unlike US startups, which are very much US teams, Israeli teams, or Swedish teams, which 
um, can break into the world need to become an international startup, what we call a mini multinational that has other cultures integrated in it. And then companies like Cogent, which is now carrying 12% of the world internet traffic, which is broadband service provider, and is a company that we started with Israeli technology in the United States, and uh, has huge amount of um, data centers, and is basically uh, the, the big carrier of what we call the visual internet. Because everybody today wants video, and everybody wants video close to them, and that means that there's a big clogging of the network. And companies like Precise and Enterprise Software, and of course, many, many more, which are companies that helped Israel define itself as the second hub for emerging growth companies that are going internationally, um, that is uh, uh, from a very small place and has happened very quickly. Um, we have an incubator, and just if you want to build something large, you need to be able to be patient to start small. And you need to have an environment where the youngest person on the team can be just as important in the conversation as the most experienced investor and the most important person on the team. This is uh, something that an, a good incubator needs to be able to enable because sometimes the best ideas come from the people that have the least quote-unquote status. It's something in Jewish learning. When you sit around uh, an old text and you interpret the text, there is a tradition that the youngest student has the same rights to speak as the greatest rabbi. And that tradition of the round table, the dialectic table, is something that you need to cherish because otherwise you miss the good ideas. And so we sit in Jerusalem in a warehouse that belong, was from the time of the Turks in the old train station where you have small rooms and large rooms. You have a meeting area where everybody comes together around a few meals a day and you have vibrant, interesting discussions. Um, and then Israel, I think, and in general, we are the high-tech entrepreneurs of the world. We need to realize that we are in the center of a change in the technology revolution that we help create. And Israel is in the center of that. So in the 90s, Israel was helping build the technology infrastructure for the world. And we served two masters. One was the big communication giants. The big communication giants needed to move the networks from voice to data. And when they needed to do that, they needed fiber optics. They needed wireless. They needed semiconductors. They needed VLSI. They needed all kinds of capabilities that were built in defense, big defense industries. Here you have it with Ericsson. You have it with Saab. You have it with some other uh, big companies as well. And what we were doing <coughs> is we were working together on taking some of these ideas, trying to listen very closely to the big giants, and building them products that basically changed the way they were able to do things. And some of these things, they needed so much that they paid us outrageous prices for inventing these things. So Chromatis was wave division multiplexing in the metro. It's the ability to take one fiber and multiply its capacity but eight by 80 light waves on the same fiber by creating 80 streams of communications that are distinct on the same fiber and being able to bring this to the metro. So this kind of capability is what I call core technology. And those core technologies, everybody gave us such a large premium for this that we really focused on that. But then the world changed. I was living with my family for two weeks in Tribeca in Manhattan, and we moved there two weeks before 9-11. And my little daughters were going to school underneath the World Trade Center. And everybody was telling me, 
oh, you're so lucky because there's so many security problems in Israel. You're going to live in New York for a while and you're going to relax. Well, two weeks later, two planes hit the World Trade Center. And I wasn't relaxed at all because my daughters were in a school underneath the, the, the World Trade Center. And so we got a wake-up call that the world changed. But it changed in a big way. And what it meant is that we were not going to get the same premium anymore just by creating outstanding technology. The world got into the Ice Age. And you have some traces of the Ice Age here in Sweden, more than we have in Israel. But it was frozen. The big communication giants were hardly buying anything. They over-invested in the capacity. And people were not um, making big investments in new technologies. And we felt like this roadrunner in the uh, cartoons where, you know, you're off the cliff, but you're still running in the air. And um, we were looking where to land. And so we needed, I think, all of us to reinvent ourselves in one way or another. And if the two major masters of the world of technology and venture capital were the big communication giants on one hand and the large enterprises on the other, a new master has been emerging and we better listen to this master because this master is telling us what to do. And today the new master is the individual. Sometimes they're called the consumer. And what you have with a consumer or the individual is you have a situation where you can have an army of technology people with 3D capabilities and graphics, and you can build the best kind of environments, but if the child doesn't smile because the story is not funny, then the entire company cannot move an inch forward. And with this new individual, there are new players that need to enter the club of the engineers that sometimes has been closed so that they may produce and introduce new concepts. And that are people like artists, writers, advertising, spiritual people, doctors, different people from different disciplines that if we are to be relevant as we were to the big technology revolution, we need to realize that now we are in the midst of a cultural revolution that the technology is enabling. And that's a totally different task. And all of a sudden, you find that certain areas in the world which were just very good in engineering or technology and have a little bit of an issue of introducing the Renaissance uh, thinking of other disciplines are staying behind. And so New York is becoming a much stronger hub in the United States than Boston. Because in New York, you have storytellers, you have media people, you have finance, you have young artists. Yes, the art schools are becoming just as strategic as the engineering schools. Because you need other forms of creativities that are going to be relevant for the consumers or the individuals. What is the difference between Samsung and Apple? Culture. They're both a hardware company, but one of them has design, video, music, and one of them brings a new culture to the world, and so they're valued very, very differently. Click is an example that <coughs> is a sign of democracy coming to the enterprises. If it used to be the case that the CEO and the analyst and the CFO were the ones who were asking the tough questions about the business of the big company, um, today the power 
is coming to the people. Tolstoy said at the end of um, War and Peace that the soldiers know much more about the war than the generals. Well, imagine if you had a tool that will enable them to analyze what's going on and to communicate with each other between the trenches. Then you'd really know what's going on, and that's what ClickTech is to the organization. And as months, when he was the CEO and others were teaching us, the investors that were backing the company, we were frustrated that the big sales of the company were not coming from the top. SAP and Oracle were always selling big, uh, you know, uh, big projects from the top. And in our case, it was always coming from the department downstairs. It was always coming from usage in different departments. But our biggest problem became our biggest asset because we were actually a tool of the employees, not necessarily the managers. And it was spreading like mushrooms in different organizations. And the pyramid has been put on its head because now the employees have the power to understand what's going on and to ask the system, how can I make a difference without going through their bosses or the CEOs? And I think that Mans and Lars and others and us on the board, both Excel partners and JVP and industry funded here in Sweden, um, uh, where the biggest uh, enjoyment of the ride is something that Israeli companies go through often as well. And that is, you maintain the excellence in Sweden or in Israel. You don't make it an American company. You maintain the excellence in the country of origin. But you create a DNA of an international team that both gives uh, and contributes from the Swedish culture, but also receives back from the individual countries where you have your new managers coming from. And you create a mini multinational where everybody is equal on the team in terms of what they have to contribute when they speak. It's very different than the American way when you go, go out of America because that's more of a colonial model. Colonial model is something that I call where you have one headquarters and they tell everybody what to do. And it usually only works when IBM or Microsoft, they're really big and they can tell everybody what to do. And I think that if you create a company out of Sweden with international capabilities or out of Israel with international capabilities and you dare and enter the United States um, with mistakes that you can make, I mean, you always make mistakes, um, but you correct them as you go, then you, you really have the two ingredients. You have the international dialogue, and you have the American market, and you have a company that's both American and international, and it's a very, very big asset, and it becomes a much stronger team uh, culturally than any other startup that starts just in one country. Other, other um, companies which are good examples of the combining the revolution of technology and new media is a company like Ciano. Ciano is the first company in the world to give a chipset for digital TV on mobile devices that goes through the air and not through the web. In Europe, it's called DVBH or DVBT. The Europeans did not implement it, even though Europe gave us the inspiration to create the company. Um, but we actually changed our direction and helped the Chinese government define the standard for China. And today with this company, we have more than 50% of the Chinese market. We are very strong in Brazil, in Argentina, in Japan. And we're probably coming soon to the US. But here's what we realized. We realized that just being a chipset, we're leaving most of the money on the table. And we wanted to help people define the new 
the new concept of personal TVs on their iPads on, or their mobile devices because it's going to be very different than the TV that you consume on the couch. And so the, my two partners, Rafi Kesten and Gadi Tirosh, were the founders of NDS. NDS is sold, it was announced this, uh, this month to Cisco in Israel for $5 billion. They created DirecTV and they created the video on demand in the house. Now they're helping the company create the video on demand for the personal uh, consumer. <coughs> and in that respect, we're partnering with the European companies that understood the software better than we do and put the two efforts together so that we can have a much larger play. And I can tell you that even if you have strong revenues, going public in the US or a NASDAQ is a bit of an issue if you don't have a vision which maintains your margins and is diversified enough. Um, Anyclip is another example. Anyclip was a company that started in a bar in New York in a meeting that I had with a former head of Sony. And I told him after a while, this is one of my uh, weaknesses and strengths, I told him, I feel we have a company between us. And um, he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you, look, you have so many ideas and I have ideas and it just seems like we should put this on paper and see if there's an idea here that could become a company. And so we took a big napkin. We tried not to watch all the beautiful people that were around us because it was a very uh, a hip bar. And um, after about 20 minutes, we came up with this idea that, <coughs> you know, we all watch movies, but we really remember a moment, a clip, a line from a movie. And we want to bring it back into certain situations, whether it's an e-card or whether it's an SMS that you want to have something from the movie instead of saying it yourself, or whether it's um, whatever it is you want for uh, you know, a term paper in school. And um, like, um, you know, like what we want to say uh, in many ways to some of the politicians, hasta la vista, baby. And, um, the, uh, and so we put this concept together where we can license the big uh, libraries from the big studios and put it into a format which is the most searchable format for moments from films that could be then retracted and used on the web, on your mobile devices. And it's a company that is now has many, many users and is becoming a really hot, interesting little company. And then Fantactics, this is a company that came out of our animation studio. We have an animation studio in Jerusalem, and one of the spin-outs uh, is really a gaming company. And uh, Fantactics is developing um, the games for Mission Impossible 4, for Rango, the animated film, and lately for um, uh, Hunger Games. Uh, Hunger Games is a cool film, and together with Lionsgate, we own the site for these games. And obviously, there are many users around the world when a new movie comes about, and um, um, it's really, really cool. So as you can see, in the beginning, this started with enabling technologies, wave division multiplexing on fiber optics, last smile in wireless, all kind of things which were really just technological. And now, it's the combination of technology and other creativity that uh, is just so interesting and so um, encouraging to see uh, where the world really needs to change. Um, so, um, as you can see, <laughs> this is an exciting time, 
And one of the things uh, that is happening is that the next big companies <clears throat> are being put together by people that are coming from different geographies sometimes and different disciplines of thought. And you really need to be able to create an environment which is an open environment. Most of these companies move into the large cities rather than being isolated in technology parks outside the city. Because while in the past, the engineers were content to have a sandwich on the side, today, the new media startup geeks need a cafe, they need theater, they need culture, they need each other, <coughs> and they need to go out. And a society that wants to maintain and wants to uh, encourage these young, dynamic entrepreneurs needs to be able to be an open society in many ways. And um, it needs to be open nationally, but it also needs to be open internationally. And um, a lot of the ideas can become great companies if they move in the right direction internationally. Thank you very much. This is great to hear. Um, and um, if anybody have any questions, please put them forward now, because now is uh, time when we have Ariel here. There's one over here. Uh, hi, Ariel. I'm uh, Alexander Berg. I'm a doctor. I have a company here in Sweden where we, we have skin advice in any device. You take a photo of your skin problem, you send it to us. It's very impressive, uh, your exits that you have. 34, was that right? Uh, 23. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll uh, get there. But we still have 35 companies in our portfolio. The smallest one is three people in a room, but the largest one is 1,500 people. So we'll get there. What I understand as well from the geography we came, you like taking risks. How, how, is the, how big is the failure rate on startups in Israel? And how much do the people learn when they fail? Uh, well, I'm sure the failure rate is quite high. We don't have a high enough failure rate in JVP, and I, I'll tell you why I say that. We stick on to companies too long. <laughs> That's our weakness and our strength. And uh, because sometimes you stick too long and, um, you know, it really doesn't get you very far. And you take the time of the partner and the CEO and you can have them work on something else which makes more sense. But sometimes, like one of our companies now, it's very difficult and it's lonely for a few years. But then this company all of a sudden reached $60 million of revenues in 2009 and now it's $220 million of revenues in 2012. And so... Sometimes it pays off to be stubborn. Um, but I think there should be a relatively high failure rate because not all the ideas make sense in terms of a big company. And so I think that one of the most interesting things in cultures that encourage entrepreneurship is that if you, if you make an attempt with a startup and you don't succeed, it's okay as long as you did it with honesty, as long as you did it in a fair uh, effort together with other people. And um, in Switzerland, when you, when you go bankrupt, it's illegal, <laughs> you know? And so I think it's very difficult to have cultures which blame you when something goes wrong. And so, especially when it's a small community and Israel is small, it's contagious. And so everybody wants to be involved in the startup. <laughs> and we are a country of immigrants. Many people came from around the world. And the difference between an immigrant and somebody that their family lived uh, in some castle for, I don't know, a thousand years, is that an immigrant has nothing to lose. They can only see what they gain. And so um, I think that there's such a dynamic atmosphere in Israel and so it's, it's contagious. It's really contagious. And, uh, and those that didn't succeed at times, we have now second generation and third generation entrepreneurs. And actually, I think we've learned the most <clears throat> and the most difficult years of the venture capital. When we had the biggest exits in 99 and 2000, everybody thought we were a genius. 
But I'm telling you that we got much, much better in 2001 to 2004 when it was very difficult and we needed to reinvent ourselves. And I think the same thing goes for an entrepreneur. Any other question? Uh, just a minute, over there. The individual is the God. Uh, I also like the way you look at teams because the first, thank you, three people I hired was a, a programmer, a painter, and a landscape architect. Mm. Um, for us, uh, the individual is not God only. That would be a simple thing. He's also the artist. Uh, and I think what we see now is the end of the consumer area uh, and the return of the creative age where people do for themselves what used to be given to them. Would you like to reflect? You know, I, I agree with one thing that you say, that anybody who just looks at the individual as a consumer is missing a big part of what's going on. Because, especially in new media, if your company comes up with a new concept, if all they think about is the revenue model immediately, they will probably miss their concept. In other words, you need to be able to devote yourself to the experience that you're creating when you're serving that individual or the group of individuals that your new product is aiming for. And, if you, and it usually is the case when you begin to develop the, the product as you are listening to what's going on and you try to really create a special experience, you change the offering in a different way. And so if you can create a process where you have audience and you have people coming back and you define in a good conceptual, clear way what it is that you're offering that no one else is offering in the world, for the value system of the individual that's using your product, you probably have something special. And if that's the case, you're going to have many people coming to you. And when you're going to have many people coming to you, that's the time to think of the exact revenue model. If Zynga was thinking about advertising when it created the experience of Farmville, they would get nowhere. Who knew that they can sell a cow for $5? A virtual cow. But because Farmville was a real interesting, you know, simple. You saw some of the games that are catching on. They're not, they don't have the, the most amazing 3D graphics because they, they need to be used on all computers and cell phones. It's really the, the creative process. Then it became really interesting when everybody wanted a cow or a cornfield or whatever it is that they wanted to trade with the other farmer, suddenly there was something that you could pay for and it made sense. Thank you very much. And uh, it's really a great pleasure, Errol, to have you here and Christina. And we will have to continue with the program now. But as you understand, um, both Christine and Ella represents experience that had taken many companies international. Christina with her own company and GVP with many other companies. And we need to go global double quick with our companies today because it's global directly. It's a great pleasure, Errol, to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.